صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we're looking at the Adhan today insha'Allah The Adhan The Adhan Let's look a little bit about the history of the Adhan Before we begin by defining the Adhan itself And before we even begin that Lyson played BEMK420 It's a Toyota I'm assuming this person is blocking someone BEMK420 A Toyota so let's look at the history of the Adhan before we define what the Adhan is. There is a companion by the name of Abdullah ibn Zayd al-Ansari. Abdullah ibn Zayd al-Ansari radiallahu an. One time he went to sleep and he saw a man come in his dream and came towards him and started circling him. And that man was carrying something in Arabic is called a naqus. A naqus is pretty much a piece of wood or it's, it's an object where it's made out of the horns of a particular animal and usually they would beat this behind a drum and this is what the adhan was before it was legislated so he saw this man coming with this naqus and he's beating, beating it and making a loud sound with it so Abdullah asks this man what are you doing? so he says that I'm calling towards the salah I'm calling towards the prayer so the uh, this companion Abdullah he responds and he says afala adulluka ala ma huwa khayrun min dhalik shouldn't I tell you of something else that you can do that's better than what you're showing me so this man he says bala which means okay go ahead no problem so Abdullah Ibn Zayd al-Ansari radiallahu an he says the adhan he starts saying to him Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah until the end of the adhan so then he wakes up <laughs> Abdullah when he wakes up he goes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and he tells him what he saw in his dream and the Prophet sallallahu when he heard this he tells Abdullah, go to Bilal, فَإِنَّهُ أَنْدَى مِنْ صَوْتِكَ So he says, go to, Ab go to Bilal because verily his voice can project louder than your voice. So what did the Prophet ﷺ do here now? He already approved of this adhan or this proclaim that this man saw in his dream. So Abdullah says, okay, he goes to Bilal, he teaches Bilal the adhan. And then, while he's teaching it to him, Umar ibn al-Khattab is in his house <coughs> and he hears the adhan. He hears the sound coming from Bilal. So what does he do? He runs out of his house and he's holding his garment. And while he's holding his garment and he says, فَإِنِّي قَدْ رَأَيْتُ مَا رَأَى He says, verily I saw exactly what he saw, meaning Abdullah. In other words, Umar ibn al-Khattab had the same dream that Abdullah had as well. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard that Umar had it, what does he say? فَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدِ He says, Alhamdulillah. This narration is found in the Sunan of Abi Dawood and it is an authentic narration. Defining the Adhan is very simple. Adhan literally means a proclamation, an announcement. And the reason why it's called Adhan is because the word Adhan comes from an Arabic root word which is Udhun. Udhun means your ears. So Udhun is your ears. Adhan is the sound that you hear with your ears. And Mu'adhin is the person that makes that sound, that makes that proclamation. Uh, in terms of a legal definition or according to the Sharia, ah, the Adhan is an act of worship. This is the first point. It's an act of worship. Announcing the time for the obligatory prayers. This is the second point and this is crucial because from the definition here when we say it is an announcement for the obligatory prayers this shows you that the adhan is not required for any other prayer except the five daily prayers doesn't matter if it's a janazah, eid or anything else the, the adhan is only for these five daily prayers there is one exception to this 
which we'll look at when we come to that insha'Allah. And also, this is the third part of the definition, using statements and phrases that the Prophet ﷺ himself narrated. The Prophet ﷺ himself agreed and he narrated these words himself. So we have a little bit of the history. We define what adhan is. So now let's look at the ruling. What is the hukum of the adhan? The status of the adhan in our sharia. Some of the scholars are of the opinion that the adhan is highly, highly recommended. But the most common and the most agreed upon opinion amongst the ulama is that the adhan is a fardun kifaya. What that means is that if some people can do it, then it's exempted from the rest. What that means is if you put that into a practical perspective, if you have a bunch of masajid in the community or in a city or in a village, as long as these masajids, as long as they perform the adhan and they adhere to it, then it is exempted from other places, your home. If you decide that you don't want to perform the adhan in your house, that's fine. Why? Because you have a group of people or a group of organizations or masajid that have fulfilled this obligation of the adhan itself. Let's take a look a little bit about the blessings of the Adhan. The blessings of the Adhan. Number one, the first ble blessing the Prophet wasallam mentions to us that the people, the Mu'adhin, or the people that will have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment are the Mu'adhinun. The people who have the longest necks on the Day of Judgment are going to be the Mu'adhinun. This is a hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim. Now what does that mean? That you have the longest neck on Yawmul Qiyamah. What that means is that everybody will know who that individual is. His status and his honor and his recognition will be raised on the Day of Judgment. So he's going to be honored on that day. A second blessing of the Mu'addin is a hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim. This hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu, he mentions that if people knew, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ nas. If people knew what is within the nida or the adhan, if people knew what was within the adhan and the first line in a salah, they would crawl towards the prayer. What does this mean? It means if you knew the reward of being in the masjid just before the adhan goes, <coughs> and then after that, you knew the reward of standing in the front line of the prayer, if you knew exactly what the reward was, even if you had to crawl to the masjid, you would crawl to the masjid. Another narration mentions even if you had to vote on who would be able to stand in the front line, you would sit there and you would literally vote who will qualify to be in the front line. Number three, third blessing is a hadith of Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhi mentions that the Mu'addin who has given the Adhan for at least 12 years, wajabat lahu al-Jannah. Just listen to the words. The person who gives Adhan for at least 12 years in his life, it is wajib for him to have Jannah. Wajabat lahu al-Jannah. You notice this hadith doesn't say, dakhalat lahu al-Jannah, he'll just enter paradise. It doesn't say that. It says that it's wajib, which means that there is no turning back. This person, inshaAllah, is guaranteed Jannah by Allah Azza wa Jalla. Then it continues. Every single time a person gives the Adhan, they will get 60 Hasanat, 60 blessings. And the person who does the Iqama gets 30 blessings, 30 Hasanat. Why mention that at the end of the Hadith? The Hadith starts off, whoever gives the Adhan, wajabat lahu al-Jannah if he does it for 12 years. The Prophet ﷺ was such a genius. He knew that this is impossible. Like it's literally that difficult for somebody to do this consistently for 12 years. So then he caters to the majority of the people who are able to just give the adhan once in a while. Whenever you enter a masjid, the mu'adhan is not there or you're the only guy standing there. So what should you do? Give the adhan. Why? Because you'll get 60 hasanat. Then... The person who gives the adhan may not be the person who will call the iqama. So you're standing there and perhaps maybe the mu'adhan, you know, he went to the washroom or something just before the salah. So the person who steps up and gives the iqama, 30 blessings for them. 
A fourth hadith is one that's very, very powerful. The Prophet ﷺ mentions an authentic hadith in Bukhari that whoever amongst the jinns or the, sh uh, or the um, shayateen or human beings, the jinns or the shayateen or the human beings, whoever amongst them have heard the adhan, shahida lahu yawmul qiyamah. They will actually testify that that person gave the adhan in this, uh, in this dunya on the day of judgment. Their testification will count. Now, some of you probably might be thinking, well, how does that work if whenever the shaitan hears the adhan, he runs away? Well, the way that you tie this together is the hadith says, heard. When everybody, whenever the jinn or human being heard the adhan, whether they respond to it or not is irrelevant. The hadith just specifically mentions that they heard the adhan. So when the shayateen and the jinns, they hear the adhan, even though they run away, the point is they're running away from something that they heard. So that alone counts, and it goes as a testification for the mu'adhin on yawmul qiyamah. A few points to note regarding the adhan and the iqamah. So let's get into the nitty gritty stuff now. A person is recommended to give the adhan and the iqama even when they are traveling alone. Even if you're traveling by yourself, there's a recommendation, mustahab, highly recommend for you to give the adhan. And this is based on an authentic hadith in Bukhari <coughs> that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once uh, gave advice to a companion. And he says, verily, I see that you are a person who loves taking care of sheep." So when you are uh, when so when you are in your pastures, so when you're within those field areas taking care of these animals, or you're in the wilderness, raise your voice and make the adhan. So here the Prophet ﷺ orders this man, even though he's by himself, he's traveled away from his family, you still should make the adhan. As we mentioned, the adhan is only for, the adhan and the iqamah is only for the five daily prayers. But there is one exception to this. Now this exception is not for an adhan, but it's for a proclamation. Uh, some of you might have heard, there's a couple of prayers like the, uh, sorry, the eclipse prayer. And uh, there is one other prayer as well, the eclipse prayer and the istisqa, the prayer for rain. These two types of prayer it is highly recommended for the person to take the microphone and say As-Salatul Jami'ah As-Salatul Jami'ah literally means that the prayer has been established a prayer has been established and the, the Mu'adhin he can repeat this as many times as he needs to so he will literally take the microphone and he will say As-Salatul Jami'ah Salatul Jami'ah, and he can say it as much as he can, and this is the way that he would call the community to come to the masjid and pray. Another important point when it comes to the adhan is that it is permissible. This is the general ruling. It is permissible for a woman also uh, to perform the adhan and the iqamah, but with one condition, and this condition, of course, is that other men cannot hear her giving the adhan or the iqamah. The evidence for this is that Aisha radiallahu anha, whenever she was an imama, whenever she would lead other women in prayers, she herself would also give the adhan and the iqamah. Some of the ulama, they dislike this, like Imam Malik, uh, uh, Imam Ahmed, they said that there is an iqamah but no adhan. Imam Abu Hanifa, he says there's nothing. She doesn't have to do anything. She can just literally start her prayer. Imam Shafi'i, he mentions that there's a karaha or a dislikeness to the adhan, but she should at least do the iqamah. The whole issue is her voice. Because according to some ulama, her voice here is like, acts like an awra when it comes to the salah. That's why whenever a woman, she's praying behind a man, and if the man makes a mistake in his recitation, so he's like, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقَ And he makes a complete dead mistake. She doesn't correct him. She doesn't say, Allahu Samad. What she will do is, she'll clap. This is exactly what she would do in the prayer. Why? Because according to some ulama, 
her voice becomes an awrah or acts like one at least within that act of worship. So that's where the issue. But as I mentioned to you, the general rule when scholars look at these three opinions is that it's permissible for her to do as long as she lowers her voice. Um, another point, this is very relevant to us, a recorded adhan. A recorded adhan or an adhan that you hear off the internet or the radio. Are you allowed to follow this adhan and let this adhan count for you? Let me tell you why this is so important. Because a lot of people, especially in Ramadan, they will take their cell phone and they will set it. They'll have the whole uh, prayer times all set there. And they'll wait and they'll wait until that adhan happens before they break the fast or stop their suhoor. The qu now that's fine. Basically what's happening here is that that phone is acting as a timer and that's okay, permissible, no, no issue here. The point is, is that are you going to get the reward for repeating after this adhan you hear on the phone? The answer is an obvious no. Why? Because you need an intention for a proper adhan to happen. You actually need a physical person to be there. This also eliminates another problem as well that a lot of people do. I mean, subhanAllah, you know, we live in a time where a lot of Muslims look for back doors to get things done. They're always looking for like the easy way out. So you have this other issue of, can you also follow the adhan of Mecca and Medina when you're watching satellite? You know, you see your favorite mu'adhan there, so you turn up the volume and it's also, you know, time for salah for you. So you use the same adhan, the same ruling it applies here. So it's not accepted as, a, as an adhan, but you can most definitely use it as a, a timer. Now, the words of the adhan are of two types. Now, here's the first type that we're all used to. This is the adhan reported by Abdullah ibn Zayd and Umar ibn al-Khattab, that same narration that I just gave you in the very beginning. This is the adhan that we're all used to. This is a sahih adhan narrated in the sunan of Abi Dawood. So Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Shadu wa la ilayhi Allah, shadu wa la ilayhi Allah, shadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah, shadu wa Muhammad Rasulullah. Hayy ala salah twice. Hayy ala al falah twice. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. That's the first adhan, that's the one we're always used to hearing. Now there's also a second type of adhan that was narrated by a companion by the name of Abdul Mahdura al Jamahi. Abdul Mahdura al Jamahi radiallahu an. He mentions that, uh, and by the way, I looked up this particular Sahaba. He was actually one of the Mu'addin in Mecca. He was one of the Mu'addin in Mecca. And he also mentions that the Prophet وسلم, taught him the Adhan in the following manner. So here's the other adhan that he was taught by the Prophet ﷺ himself. Now this here is a narration found in Sahih Muslim. So there's no doubt in its authenticity. Now imagine hearing an adhan like this. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah, ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah Hayya 'ala as-salah hayya 'ala as-salah hayya 'ala al-falah hayya 'ala al-falah Allahu akbar Allahu akbar la ilaha illallah Everybody here you heard what happened right There was a repetition something was repeated twice what was it? It was the kalima. It was the testification in the adhan itself. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah twice was repeated again and ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah was also repeated. This is also an authentic way of performing the adhan. So adhans are of two types. Now, the issue here is this. Which adhan should you use? Which is the adhan that you should use? According to the ulama, what they advise here at this particular point is that both adhans should be used occasionally. So this way you can preserve both styles. For a lot of us, I'm sure this is the first time you're ever hearing an adhan like this. And as I mentioned to you, this is a hadith narrated in Sahih Muslim. It is hadith number 868. You can look, at it up, look it up yourself. And it's mentioned here to repeat that kalima twice. 
But the reason why this is, doesn't happen in our times, or at least it's not that common, is simply because it's a time factor issue. A lot of people have to leave after the salah. We don't have that much time to lengthen the prayers. Things like that. A lot of logistical problems that happen, which is why the most common thing is we always use the shorter version of the... Um, <coughs> The adhan. When it comes to the iqama, something very similar happens. Now listen to the iqama that we're all used to. This is the iqama of Abdullah ibn Zayd, same hadith narrated in Sunan of Abi Dawood. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Shadu Allah, Ilaha illallah, Ashadu Anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. So we're not repeating anything twice here. Hayya ala salah, Hayya ala falah, Qad qamat al salah, Qad qamat al salah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. That's the one we're all used to. The second one is that you're basically repeating everything twice. This is also another version of the Adhan, and uh, sorry, the Iqama, and this is found in the Sunan of Abi Dawood. The Sunan of Abi Dawood, and this here, rightfully so, is the Iqama that the same Sahaba that narrated that different Adhan is the same one that narrates the other Iqama as well. Uh, <coughs> Abdul uh, Mahdura Al Jamahi. He mentions here that basically you're repeating everything twice. So he'll, so the, the, the muadhin will give the iqama and he will say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah, Ashadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. And he's repeating everything twice. Again, it's also an appropriate way uh, of giving the iqama. Which one should you use? Same ruling applies here as it does to the Adhan. Occasionally, it is permissible to use both. In terms of the strongest opinion uh, of all of these recorded wordings that we see here, that as I mentioned to you, to use them occasionally, you want to note this down, that this is the opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. And Ibn Taymiyyah has a very classical standard way of explaining why this is so important and simply he mentions whatever is established in the Quran and Sunnah with authentic evidence no one is allowed to reject it so that's the issue here that we have now let's look at a couple of fiqh issues when it comes to the um, adhan when it comes to the adhan the mu'adhin versus the imam which one here when I say the mu'adhin versus the um, the Imam so we want to know in terms of blessings what are the blessings for each the first one this is the first opinion by the way is that the Mu'adhin gets a greater reward than the Imam the Mu'adhin gets a greater reward than the Imam what is the evidence? the evidence is a verse in the Quran we've all heard وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ now, whoever, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا And what is more beautiful and more righteous in terms of statement than the one who calls towards Allah? You see how strong this evidence is? It's a very, very open evidence. No one can deny it. So the Mu'adhin here, scholars say, of course the Mu'adhin is calling people to righteousness, so he gets most of the reward. <coughs> Second opinion is the Imam gets most of the reward. And the logic behind this is, the ulama, they say that the Prophet ﷺ himself never gave an adhan. The Khulafa al-Rashidun never gave adhan. And basically, many of the scholars of Islam and the Salaf, they've never given adhan. Even in our times, you're not going to see like Shaykh Uthaymeen or somebody or the Shaykh bin Bazizam, they wouldn't give an adhan. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah did it once and it was recorded. It was like a huge event. Shaykh al-Bani is giving an adhan. Why is just something that they... For some reason, one reason or other, they just chose not to do it. Other students or other uh, individuals were were given that role. The third opinion, <coughs> the third opinion is that they both share great rewards in their own uh, right. So they both share the same reward. In other words, the Imam has certain rewards that are exclusive just for him, whereas the Mu'addin, he's not exempted, he also has rewards that are also exclusive to him as well. All of these here complement one another. And of course, Imam al-Shafi'i and Imam al-Nawi, majority of scholars, they say that the Mu'addin gets the most reward when it comes to the Salah. Why? Because majority of people will hear the Adhan, but not all of them will respond and pray behind the Imam. 
Everybody, everybody understand his point. Most people, if not everyone, they will hear the adhan. So the mu'adhan will get the reward of everybody who's heard him. But when it comes time for the salah, not all of them are actually going to hear it or respond to it and pray behind that imam. So he becomes <coughs> um, deficient in that sense. Uh, number two, second fiqh issue is the mu'adhan as an imam. So the man, he gives the adhan and then he wants to also lead the salah. Is he allowed to do this or not? Four opinions regarding this issue. Number one is that he has a choice, but it's better for him to do both. He has a choice. He can just uh, uh, assign someone else to be the imam, but it should be him. Imagine this opinion. The man who gives the adhan, he is actually recommended to also lead us in the salah. And obviously it's because he took on that responsibility of being the mu'adhan, then that shows that he's a responsible, mature individual. So he should also be trusted with the imam position as well. A second opinion is that if he's not qualified to be an imam, then he can just do the adhan. The third opinion is the opposite of that. The, uh, the opposite of what we just mentioned here. So he's not qualified to be a mu'adhin. He doesn't have a strong voice, but let's just say he memorized Quran or something, or he has a beautiful voice. It's just not loud and he can't project it very well. Then of course here he will just be the imam and not the mu'adhin. The third, the fourth opinion is that he has a choice, either or. So you see the difference between the fourth and the first opinion. The first opinion gives you something that's a little bit better for you to do, which is you should try to do both. The last opinion, it's all up to you. You decide whatever you want and that is Allah who alam, Allah knows best, but the most correct opinion that they literally have a choice in the matter. Last couple points inshallah before we conclude. Um, some qualities that are desirable in a mu'adhin. The mu'adhin, he should be a person that is trustworthy and reliable. He should also have a loud voice and a pleasant voice that's beautiful to hear. It's pleasant in its delivery as well. He should also be knowledgeable about the times of prayer. So let me tell you this, brothers and sisters. Looking at the clock, the timings of prayer is not an indication that you have knowledge of the salah times. Let me repeat this again. If you have a watch or you have a cell phone or you look at the masjid timings and you depend on it, this is not an evidence in the sharia. It doesn't even count. What must happen is that you as a mu'adhin, you must know or have a good idea of the timings in terms of what are the signs that you look for outside. What are the changes in the horizon? What are the changes in the color of the sky? Then you can add timings to it. This is why when we talked about the timings of prayer, we mentioned a very, very explicit statement. There is no exact time for salah. Nobody can say that salah is exactly 543. And if you pray 545, then you've prayed late. Nobody can say that. A couple minutes before, a couple minutes off, it doesn't make an issue. That's important for us. Why? Because when you go to one masjid, the maghrib will probably be like 550. You go to another masjid, it's 547. You go to a third masjid, it's 553. What are you going to do? Are you going to go up to the, to the admin there and be like, you guys have wrong salah times? No, you're not. Because again, there's no exact time. What there is though, is an exact a pro proximity of the timings itself. The mu'adhan should know all of this. The actions of the mu'adhan, he should give the adhan while standing. This is based on many authentic uh, ahadith. The adhan should also be done in a state of wudu. It should be done in a state of wudu. However, this is a recommendation and not a shart or a condition for a valid adhan. But he should be in a state of purity because the Prophet ﷺ <coughs> disliked mentioning Allah's name except that he was in a state of purity. The adhan should also be given in a high place like how Bilal radiallahu anhu used to do. He used to stand and used to elevate himself so his voice could project. Um, this here, we don't really have an issue with that simply because we have access to a microphone. You could be sitting in a corner somewhere or standing inside of a room. As long as you have a microphone, everybody's going to hear you anyways. Uh, the mu'adhin should also face the qibla. These are all etiquettes. They should turn to the right when they say hayya ala salah and they should turn to the left when they say hayya ala al-falah. The question is, how do you do it? Do you do it like this? Hayya ala salah. No. 
what happens here? Scholars are very, very explicit about this. Imam al nawawi rahimahullah, actually has a very, very detailed discussion on how this happens. So basically what would happen is that the person, the mu'adhin, will literally just turn his head to just a slight degree that his voice is not distorted from the microphone. It is incorrect for a mu'adhin to do this. To say, Hayya ala salat and come back to it again, right? It defeats the whole purpose. Now the reason, some of us probably might be wondering, like, why, why do that in the first place? This is not for any other reason except that you're just projecting your voice to the people on one end and to the people to the other end. How perfect is the adhan? When you're doing this, you're saying, Hayya ala salah. So come to the prayer. Those of you who are on that side that can't really hear me, Come to success. Those of you who are on that side, you can't really hear me. This is especially crucial for uh, places where they don't have the microphone. It's the exact opposite when you do have a microphone. When you do have a microphone and you turn away from it, you've actually gone against the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because you're defeating the purpose of the microphone, you're defeating the purpose of that action. But unfortunately, you know, the reality is that we live in a time where a lot of things are just cultural, a lot of things are just traditional. You know, you grow up and you see that Mu'adhan, he's always doing this. Some Mu'adhan turned their whole body. I remember, actually, I know this one Mu'adhan in one particular masjid I go to. Sometimes I give khutbah there and I'll be sitting on the, the menbur, the pulpit. Then the Mu'adhan will stand on my right and he'll give the Adhan. When he gets to Hayya ala salah, he's looking directly at my face. And he's actually distracting me than anything else. He'll turn his entire body and he'll look at me like this. Hayya ala salah. And he's looking at me right in my face, right? Then he'll turn around his whole body to the other. This is all brothers and sisters against the etiquettes of the adhan in and of itself. So it's important, crucial to be very careful with that. Also from the sunnah is to put the fingers in the ear. This was also an action of Bilal radiallahu an. Um, to beautify the adhan. Next point is to beautify the adhan with one's voice. Now this is the real crucial issue. How do you beautify your voice when it comes to the adhan? Because unfortunately, we live in a time where a lot of mu'adhin use the adhan time as a time for them to practice their vocal cords. And they practice their beauty in their voice. It's like an, an, an audition for America's Got Talent or something, right? They go up there and they just let it all out. And then some of them, they get really, really carried away. You know what ends up happening? I'm sure all of us here have heard this. You ever hear when a guy's giving adhan and he's like, Hayya ala al-fala. <laughs> and he's just squeezing every inch of breath out. Why? What's the, what's the wisdom behind it? This is a person who is uneducated and very, very careless when it comes to the salah. And then you have other muazzin that just got even more careless than that. When they start losing their breath, you know what they do? And they just continue. They won't stop, right? So they'll pause and take a breath and then continue again. So subhanAllah, it be, this is what the adhan eventually came out to be. Now, what do you do in this case? Uh, singing the adhan, I'm just, this is a terrible word to use, but basically vocalizing the adhan in that manner is actually the sunnah. Where it goes against the sunnah is when you break the rulings and principles of the Arabic language. Let me give you an example. The Arabs here, who, and anybody here who speaks Arabic, you know exactly what we're talking about. Arabic, when you pronounce certain words and the madda, they all have limits. They all have a certain amount of time that you stretch words. This is what we call in Arabic tajweed. Tajweed is not applied to only Quran. Tajweed is applied to the Arabic language. This is what gives it its brilliance and its eloquency. Is that when you practice tajweed rules, the Arabic just sounds that much sweeter. So as long as you maintain those rules, it's fine. So you can say, Hayya ala salam. That's it. But if you say, Allahu Akbar Allah, then what you're doing here is two to problems. 
First of all, you've taken and you've placed a certain rule on Allah's name that wasn't there in the first place, which is the Mad. Secondly, when it comes to Allah's name, this is a huge problem because this falls into a very dangerous area where you might be making fun of the name of Allah Azzawajal. If your name is Muhammad and somebody came up to you and say, Assalamu alaikum Muhammad. What are you gonna are you gonna even respond to somebody like that? You're gonna perform ruqya on that person right away. That's what you're gonna do. But imagine if you use that same same method and you use Allah's name. How much more so do you have to be careful when it comes to Allah's name? So the mu'adhinun, all of those people who do the adhan, singing or beautifying the adhan is the sunnah. Don't get me wrong. You don't have to just literally stand there and just utter the words. You should try to beautify your voice. But just try to keep within the principles of the Arabic language and Tajweed. And last point inshallah, we'll just pause here for today because Maghrib is getting later. So uh, inshallah in our next discussion, we will continue until about 7.15 or 7.30 inshallah. But at least today I didn't cater for that. So for the sisters, we will have our class right now inshallah in about 10-15 minutes. But I just want to conclude by mentioning that uh, now in this time here, we have various different versions of the Adhan. And I remember a very famous Mu'adhan, he got in front of the TV and he said, you know, I don't do the Mecca, uh, sorry, I don't do the Madani Adhan. And I don't do the Misri or the Egyptian Adhan. And I don't do this, I only stick to this particular Adhan. What happened here is that these classific or these categorizations of the Adhan, this is not from our Sharia. There's no such thing as a Mecca Adhan. We, our own cultures, did this. Our own cultures put this where, when you hear a particular adhan, you know where it came from. So for example, the Mecca and Medini adhan, they sound like this. They will elongate Allah's name. So they will say, Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar that's the Medini Adhan, very classical. But then what others did is like, okay, well that's for them. We got our own style in Egypt or somewhere else. And then they will give their own uh, version to the Adhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then it's just so, it's unbelievable how much our culture just got involved into this. So brothers and sisters, why, do I may say, why am I doing all of this for you? It's just basically to achieve one purpose. Every time you listen to the Adhan, just ask yourself, what are you really listening to? And every time you hear the Adhan, what's really hitting the heart? What's really increasing your Iman? Is it the beauty of that particular person's voice? Or is it the Adhan itself? The Adhan starts off by establishing our Aqeedah. Then it continues by telling us how to practice that Aqeedah. So it starts off with Allahu Akbar, then it goes to Ashhadu Allah, that's our kalima. Then the second part of the kalima, Ashhadu Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. Then it tells you how to practice it. How, what do you do? Hayya ala salah. What's the result for the person who prays? Qara aflah al mu'minun. Alladina hum fi salatihim khashirun. So that's the result. Hayya ala al falah. Allah gave success to the people who have khash, who are uh, sincere, who are devoted when it comes to their salah. Then it ends off with aqidah once again. If that's what the adhan does for you, then you fulfill the goal of the adhan. But if all that you're focused on is just the beauty and the eloquence of the voice, remember that this is only for the Qur'an and nowhere else. Because the Prophet ﷺ says, زَيِّنُوا أَصْوَاتُكُمْ بِالْقُرْآنِ Beautify your voice when it comes to the Qur'an, but only that. Everything else, inshallah, has a certain beauty to it. You just have to decide what that is. So this is where we will pause, inshallah, and we will continue with the same topic, the adhan. I will actually do a tafsir of the adhan as well. 
in and of itself in our next session which will happen on this Friday insha'Allah ta'ala may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to perfect our prayers may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to perfect our hearts and our sincerity and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward our mu'adhinun especially those who have been doing it longer than you and I have been born may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them the jannah that they are promised wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh